Chapter 3, Fluid, Electrolytes, Acid-Base Balance, and Intravenous Therapy. The older adult and very young patients are more likely to experience severe consequences and complications with minor changes in their fluid balance. An infant's body is approximately 77% water and an older individual's body is about 45% water. Water has four main functions. It is a vehicle for transport of substances to and from the cells. Water aids heat regulation by providing perspiration, which evaporates and cools the body. Water assists in the maintenance of hydrogen balance in the body and water serves as a medium for the enzymatic action of digestion. Osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus sense the internal environment and promote the intake of fluid, which is the thirst mechanism, when needed. Baroreceptors in the carotid sinus and the aortic arch will detect pressure changes that indicate an increase or a decrease in blood volume and stimulate the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous system to return the pressure to normal. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is released by the posterior pituitary and controls how much fluid leaves the body in the urine and it also causes reabsorption of water from the kidney tubules. Aldosterone and arterial, excuse me, atrial natri natriumic peptide, ANP, will regulate the reabsorption of water and the sodium ions from the kidney tubules. The brain natriuretic peptide or B-type natriuretic peptide and the atrial natriuretic peptide will promote water loss and sodium ion loss from the kidney tubules and cause vasodilation. When the solution on one side of the membrane is more concentrated than the solution on the other side of the membrane, the particles in the more concentrated solution will travel through the membrane to the less concentrated side in an attempt to equalize the concentration of the two, solu the two solutions. Osmosis is when there are differences in concentration of fluids in the various compartments. Osmotic pressure, which is what holds the fluid in the vascular space, will move water from the area of lesser concentration of solutes to the area of greater concentration until the solutions in the compartments are of equal concentration. The process takes place via a semi-permeable membrane. This is a membrane that allows some substances to pass through but prevents the passage of other substances. Fluid moves between the interstitial and intracellular compartments and between the interstitial and intravascular compartments by osmosis. Filtration is the movement of water and solutes through a semi-permeable membrane. This is a result of a pushing force on one side of the membrane. Filtration occurs in the kidney where waste substances and excess water are eliminated. Active transport requires cellular energy. This can move molecules into cells regardless of their electro electrical charge or the concentrations already present in the cell. Active transport may move substances from an area of lower concentration to an area area of higher concentration. The energy source for the process is adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Amino acids, glucose, iron, hydrogen, sodium, 
potassium, and calcium are moved through the cell membrane by active transport. Any serious ill patient is at risk for a fluid and electrolyte imbalance. When thinking about sodium imbalances, it is important to remember that water follows sodium in the body through osmosis. The sodium concentration causes an osmotic pull and the water will go to where the sodium concentration is the highest. When a fluid deficit occurs, water moves from the cells into the interstitial and intravascular spaces. This movement of water out of the cell causes dehydration of the cells. Dehydration is treated by administering fluid orally, intravenously, or through feeding or gastrostomy tubes. For patients who are unable to take in fluids or food on their own, a feeding tube must be placed or total parental nutrition must be started if they are unable to take in fluids or food for an extended period of time. The most accurate measure of fluid gain or loss for any age group is weight change. A weight gain or loss of 2.2 pounds or one kilogram in 24 hours indicates a gain or a loss of one liter of fluid. Fluid volume deficit is a common problem in older adults. This is due to the age-related decline in total body water and a decrease in the thirst sensation and taste that causes older adults to become dehydrated more easily. If urinary incontinence is a problem, the individual becomes reluctant to drink extra fluids. Thirst is considered a late sign of dehydration in older adults. Signs and symptoms of dehydration include complaints of dizziness, dry cracked lips and tongue, dry mucous membranes, sunken soft eyeballs, dry scaly skin, flat neck veins when the individual is lying flat. Signs and symptoms of overhydration include weight gain, a slow bounding pulse, elevated blood pressure, firm subcutaneous tissues, possible edema, possible crackles in the lungs on auscultation, possible visual visible neck veins when the individual is lying down, decreased serum sodium, decreased hematocrit from hemodilation, and a low urine specific gravity with high volume. Nurses need to provide an adequate fluid intake for those who are unable to do this for themselves. A nurse must include the patient's preferences for liquids in the plan of care. The, place, the patient should receive fruit juices, bullion, and any other nutritious liquid that they can tolerate. Common cause of excessive fluid loss is abnormally rapid excretion of intestinal fluids that occurs from vomiting and diarrhea. Pain is something that may trigger the nausea vomiting mechanism. If vomiting occurs for the patient, the vomitus should be observed for odor, color, contents that may include undigested food, and the amount. Antiemetics may be given. Hydroxazine, promethazine, Ondesterone and metclopromide may be given to assist the patient from vomiting and feeling nauseous.
to assist the patient to control nausea and vomiting, the nurse will suggest that the patient lower their head between their legs so that the vomitus is not aspirated into the respiratory tract and therefore into their lungs. That would cause aspiration pneumonia. Diarrhea can be defined as the rapid movement of fecal matter through the intestine. Frequent watery bowel movements, abdominal cramping, and generalized weakness are all signs and symptoms of diarrhea. Watery stools will often contain mucus and may be blood streaked if they are considered as diarrhea. It is the consistency, not the number of stools per day, that is the hallmark of diarrhea. In some cases, the number of instances per day may be 15 to 20 liquid stools. If the condition is chronic, the patient may suffer from dehydration, malnutrition, and anemia. Nursing measures for diarrhea aim to provide physical and mental rest, prevent unnecessary loss of water and nutrients, protect the rectal mucosa, and replace the lost fluids. Treatment for diarrhea includes multiple or various antidiarrheals, diphenoxalate atropine, loperamide hydrochloride, kaolin pectin, bismuth subsalate, and camphorated opium tincture. The normal hematocrit values will range from 35 to 54 milliliters of red blood cells per 100 milliliters of whole blood that depends on the age and the sex of the individual. If there is an excess of water, the proportion of the red blood cells to the milliliters of blood will be lower and the hematocrit will be below the normal values because of the dilution by the water. Urine concentration will provide another clue to the fluid status. Urine concentration is measured by specific gravity and compared with spe specific gravity of distilled water, which is 1.000. Urine contains urea, electrolytes, and other substances. Therefore, the specific gravity of urine will exceed 1.000. The average range of urine specific gravity is 1.010 to 1.025. Some molecules, when placed in solution, will undergo a separation of their atoms into electrically charged ions. These molecules are called electrolytes because their atomic particles can conduct an electrical current. The molecules of electrolytes break up into atomic particles that are either negatively charged anions or positively charged cations. When sodium chloride or table salt is dissolved in body water, the molecules separate into sodium ions, which are positively charged sodium ions, and chloride ions, which are negatively charged chloride ions. Electrolyte values that need to be known. Sodium 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Potassium. 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Calcium, 8.4 to 10.6 milligrams per deciliter. Magnesium, 1.3 to 1. Point, excuse me, 1.3 to 2.1 milligrams per deciliter. Phosphate. 3.0 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. 
chloride, 96 to 106 milliequivalents per liter. Bicarbonate, 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. Which patient would be considered at risk for fluid and electrolyte imbalance? Select all that apply. A 45-year-old woman with thyroid crisis, a 35-year-old trauma victim on a ventilator, a 60-year-old woman with a temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, a 70-year-old man on anticoagulant therapy, a 30-year-old woman complaining of persistent diarrhea. The correct answer is one, two, and five. The average intake of sodium is four to five grams daily. The consequence of hyponatremia is impaired nerve conduction. Signs and symptoms for hyponatremia include fatigue, lethargy, headache, mental confusion, altered level of consciousness, anxiety, coma, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, muscle cramps, seizures, decreased sensation, and decreased blood pressure. Risk factors for hyponatremia include inadequate sodium intake, think about patients on low sodium diets, excessive intake or retention of water, Think about patients with kidney failure and heart failure. Loss of bile because it is rich in sodium as a result of fistulas, draining, or gastrointestinal surgery, nausea and vomiting, or suction. Loss of sodium through burn wounds and the administration of IV fluids that do not contain electrolytes. Signs and symptoms of hypernatremia include dry mucous membranes, taut skin turgor, intense thirst, flushed skin, oliguria, may have an elevated temperature, weakness, lethargy, irritability, twitching, seizures, coma, intracranial bleeding, or low-grade fever. Hypernatremia will cause an osmotic shift of the fluid from the cells to the interstitial spaces. This will cause a cellular depletion and an interruption of normal cell process. The sodium intake will be restricted for patients that have hypernatremia. Risk factors for hypernatremia will include a high sodium diet, Within, with inadequate water intake, thinking about a comatose patient, a mentally confused patient, or a debilitated patient, excessive sweating, diarrhea, failure of the kidneys to reabsorb water from the urine, and administration of a high protein, hyperosmotic tube feeding, and osmotic diuretics. Hypokalemia. Signs and symptoms will include abdominal pain, paralytic ileus, gaseous dissension of the intestines, cardiac dysrhythmias, muscle weakness, decreased reflexes, paralysis, urinary retention, increased urinary pH, lethargy, confusion, electrocardiogram changes. Severe hypokalemia is less than 2.5 milliequivalents per liter. This may cause cardiac arrest. Extra potassium must be given to help correct an imbalance. Adequate renal function must be present before IV potassium is administered. IV potassium must always be diluted before administration 
and it is never given as a push or a rapid undiluted injection. Risk factors for hypokalemia will include inadequate intake of potassium rich foods, loss of potassium in the urine when kidneys do not reabsorb the potassium, loss of potassium from intestinal tract as a result of diarrhea or vomiting, drainage from fistulas, or overuse of gastric suctioning, and improper use of diuretics. Hyperkalemia, signs and symptoms, may include muscle weakness, fatigue, hypotension, nausea, paresthesias, paralysis, cardiac dysrhythmias, EKG changes. Hyperkalemia can cause life-threatening cardiac dysrhythmias. Risk factors for hyperkalemia can include kidney failure or a decreased kidney function, an intestinal obstruction that will prevent the elimination of potassium in feces, Addison's disease, digitalis toxicity, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, insulin deficiency, crushing injuries or burns, an overuse of potassium containing salt substitute or overuse of potassium sparing diuretics. Hypocalcemia. This occurs when the calcium level drops below 8.4 milligrams per deciliter. Hypocalcemia results from disorders where there is a shift of calcium into the bone. The removal or injury of the parathyroid glands during a thyroidectomy causes parathyroid home hormone deficiency and consequent hypocalcemia. Carpopedal spasm or Trousseau sign. Hyperactive reflexes, Chivette's sign, and tetany, which is a muscle spasm in the hand, may occur. Laryngospasm may also occur if the deficit is severe. To determine Trousseau's, Trousseau's sign, place a blood pressure cuff on the arm of the patient and inflate the cuff above the systolic pressure and hold it for three minutes. If a spasm of the hand occurs, the reaction is positive and the patient has Trousseau's sign. For Chivette's sign, tap the facial nerve about an inch in front of the earlobe. A unilateral twitching of the face is a positive response for Chivette sign. We also will test deep tendon reflexes. We will tap a partially stretched muscle tendon with a percussion hammer. The extent of the reflex is scored from a zero to a four plus, with zero representing no response, 2 plus is a normal response, and 4 plus is a hyperactive response. Hypocalcemia risk factors will include metastatic cancer, an inadequate dietary intake of calcium and vitamin D3, impaired absorption of calcium from the intestinal tract, as in diarrhea, sprue, overuse of laxatives and enemas that contain phosphates. The parathyroid gland helps to regulate the calcium and the phosphorus level. Hyposecretion of parathyroid hormone may result in hypocalcemia. Hypercalcemia risk factors. These will include an excess intake of calcium, Think about the patient taking antacids routinely, an excess intake of vitamin D3, a condition that causes movement of calcium out of the bone and into the extracellular fluid, like a bone tumor or multiple fractures, tumors of the lung, 
stomach, kidney, and multiple myeloma, immobility, and also osteoporosis. Magnesium is vital in DNA and protein synthesis, as well as in many enzyme reactions. Magnesium imbalances are rare, but may be caused by a variety of factors. Risk factors may include for hypomagnesemia, chronic malnutrition, chronic diarrhea, bowel resection with an ileostomy or colostomy, chronic alcoholism, thiazide diuretic use, prolonged gastric suction, acute pancreatitis, biliary or intestinal fistula, osmotic diuretic therapy, or diabetic ketoacidosis. Hypermagnesemia. The risk factors for this is an overuse of antacid and cathartics that contain magnesium, an aspiration of seawater, think about a near drowning, and chronic kidney failure. Because of electroneutrality, imbalances of chloride, phosphate, and bicarbonate will accompany cation imbalances. Hypochloremia, which is a level less than 95 milliequivalents per liter, is also associated with hyponatremia. Hypochloremia can also occur with severe vomiting and may be seen as a compensatory decrease in acid-base disorders. Hypercholemia, which is a level greater than 103 milliequivalents per liter, occurs with hypernatremia and a form of metabolic acidosis. Hypophosphatemia occurs when the level falls below 3.0 milligrams per deciliter. Hypophosphatemia may result from use of aluminum containing antacids that bind phosphate, vitamin D deficiency, or hyperparathyroidism. Hyperphosphatemia, where the level is greater than 4.5 milligrams per deciliter, will commonly occur in renal failure. Hypophosphatemia. This is when the phosphate level is less than 3 mg per deciliter. Consider vitamin D deficiencies or hyperparathyroidism. Hyperphosphatemia. This is when the phosphate level is greater than 4.5 mg per deciliter. Consider patients that have renal insufficiency. For the acid-base system, it is crucial to maintain an acid-base balance due to the cell enzymes function with a very narrow pH range of 7.35 to 7.45. The pH of the body's fluids is routinely somewhat alkaline, between 7.35 and 7.45. A pH below 7.25 or above 7.55 is considered life-threatening. A pH below 6.8 indicates acidosis or a pH above 7.8 alkalosis is usually fatal. Acidosis occurs due to the loss of a base or too much acid. Alkalosis occurs due to the loss of an acid or too much base. There are three mechanisms to help balance the pH. Buffer pairs are groups of chemicals that absorb excess acids or bases. They are circulating in the blood and respond to pH changes quickly. The bicarbonate carbonic acid buffer system is responsible for more than half of the buffering. 
Three other buffer systems in the body will include phosphate, hemoglobin, and protein systems. The respiratory system will alter the breathing rate and the depth. Because carbon dioxide dissolves in the blood and combines with water to form carbonic acid, retaining or blowing off carbon dioxide will help to retain or eliminate the, the acids from the body. The kidneys can also change the excretion rate of the acids and the production as well as the absorption of the bicarbonate ion. The kidneys are slow to compensate, but they are the most effective compensating mechanism. A buffer is considered a substance that increases the amount of acid or alkali in the solution to produce a unit change in the pH. The balance of the bicarbonate ions and the carbonic ions is controlled by the respiratory system and by the kidneys. The carbon dioxide produced by cell metabolism will diffuse into the blood. Carbon dioxide will react with water and form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates or separates to form hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions as necessary. The process may be reversed in the lungs, freeing up carbon dioxide so that it can be expired along with water and therefore it reduces the total acid in the body. As long as the ratio of carbonic acid to bicarbonate is maintained at a 1 to 20 ratio, the pH remains within normal limits. In a respiratory imbalance, the lungs will retain or blow off or excrete carbon dioxide. In hypoventilation, the lungs do not eliminate enough carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide will remain in the body, unite with water, and form carbonic acid. In hyperventilation, this is where there is too much carbon dioxide and that is blown off. The renal system or the kidneys are the principal organs of control in maintaining a normal pH during metabolic activities because they may either reabsorb or excrete bicarbonate. If they eliminate too much bicarbonate, acidosis will develop. If they fail to eliminate enough bicarbonate and allow it to be reabsorbed in the bloodstream, then alkalosis will develop. The first thing that you need to look at when considering an acid-base balance is the pH. pH should routinely be between 7.35 and 7.45. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide should be 35 to 45, and bicarbonate should be between 22 to 26. A patient that has COPD is most likely to develop acute acidosis when an infection of the respiratory tract further impairs the breathing capacity and the removal of carbon dioxide. Signs and symptoms of respiratory acidosis will include complaints of increased difficulty in breathing, a history of respiratory obstruction, whether acute or chronic, dyspnea, weakness, dizziness, restlessness, sleepiness, and a mental change in mental alertness or mental status change. The treatment for respiratory acidosis is to establish or maintain the airway. The use of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or the insertion of an endotracheal tube may be necessary. Oxygen administration may be needed and the assistance of a mechanical ventilator may be required. Conservative treatment will include deep breathing exercises using an incentive spirometer, bronchodilators, 
and antibiotics if indicated. The nurse must take care to administer certain medications that depress the respiratory center. These medications will include narcotics, hypnotics, as well as tranquilizers. In diabetes mellitus, insulin insufficiency will lead to an excessive burning of fats, and the end product is fatty acids. When more energy than usual is expended, lactic acid builds up in the body as oxygenation of tissue falls. In kidney disease, there is a decreased excretion of acids and a decreased production of bicarbonate. The increased buildup of acids will cause metabolic acidosis. The symptoms of metabolic acidosis may include weakness, lethargy, headache, and confusion. If the acidosis is not relieved, these symptoms can progress to stupor, unconsciousness, coma, and death. The breath of a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis will have a fruity odor from the ketone antibodies. Think of juicy fruit. Vomiting and diarrhea may occur and aggravate the metabolic imbalance because of the loss of the fluids and electrolytes, which are essential to restoring the acid-base balance. When compensatory mechanisms are working to correct metabolic acidosis, the patients may have deep, rapid breathing, as in Kuzmol's respirations, and they may secrete urine with a low pH. The treatment for these individuals is aimed at the underlying cause. Insulin will be administered if the patient is in diabetic ketoacidosis. Dialysis may be needed to correct the problem in a patient that has kidney failure. Immediate treatment of severe metabolic acidosis requires treating the underlying cause and the administration of IV bicarbonate. Patients will hyperventilate for many reasons, including hypoxemia, where there's an insufficient oxygen. This will trigger an autonomic response in respiration, reactions to certain medications, pain, and panic. The overzealous use of mechanical ventilation may also cause hyperventilation when too much carbon dioxide is blown off. Head injuries may also lead to hyperventilation. Symptoms of respiratory al alkalosis may include deep, rapid breathing, tingling of the fingers, pallor around the mouth, dizziness, and spasms of the muscles of the hands. The treatment for hyperventilation addresses the underlying cause because the individual may breathe through a rebreather mask temporarily, mixing the excessively exhaled carbon dioxide with oxygen so that the carbon dioxide is reinhaled. If the underlying cause is panic, the treatment is aimed at preventing further hyperventilation and assisting the patient to reestablish a normal level of carbon dioxide in the blood. Sedatives may be given to calm the patient. To aid in the retention of carbon dioxide, the patient may be instructed to hold their breath or to breathe into a paper sack and then re-breathe the carbon dioxide just exhaled. This recycling of carbon dioxide can eventually restore normal carbonic acid levels within the blood. Hypokalemia may cause metabolic alkalosis because the kidneys will retain the potassium while excreting hydrogen. Other causes are drainage from intestinal fistulas, 
diuresis resulting from potent diuretics that will increase the potassium loss in the kidney, and steroid therapy, which causes the retention of sodium and chloride, as well as the loss of potassium and hydrogen. Symptoms of metabolic alkalosis will include neurologic signs like irritability, disorientation, lethargy, muscle twitching, tingling and numbness of the fingers, and convulsions and respiratory manifestations such as shallow, slow, deep respirations, decreased chest movements, and cyanosis. There also may be signs of potassium and calcium depletion. If alkalosis progresses, tetany will occur with resulting seizures and coma. Tetany is characterized by severe muscle cramps, carpal pedal spasms, laryngeal spasms, and strider, which is a, a shrill, a harsh sound on inspiration. Treatment for met metabolic alkalosis is correcting the underlying cause and attempting to restore the body fluids to a less alkaline state. Fluids and electrolytes are replaced orally and parentally as needed. Emergency measures may include the administration of an acidifying solution like ammonium chloride. When determining metabolic or respiratory acidosis or alkalosis, always begin with the pH and ask, is it 7.35 to 7.45? If it is less than 7.35, it is acid. If it is greater than 7.45, it is a base. When looking at or considering arterial blood gases, the nurse will always consider the pH first to help determine whether it is an acid issue or a base issue. For the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, this will assist to determine if the issue is respiratory. The nurse will ask, does the, does the value fall within the parameters of 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury? When considering the bicarbonate levels of arterial blood gases, this will assist to determine if the issue is metabolic. The nurse will ask, does the, ball, the value fall within the parameter of 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter? The partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood ranges from 80 to 100 milligrams per the saturation of oxygen in the blood is routinely 94 percent to 100 percent but when practicing as a nurse one must know the values of the institution where you are practicing when considering the base or the bicarbonate we look whether there is an excess or a deficit. This will help indicate whether it is alkalosis or acidosis. When thinking about home care instructions, we want to make sure that we teach our patient about the requirements for fluid intake or restriction. They need to monitor their adherence to the sodium restriction by periodically checking their food intake. They need to obtain feedback to be certain that they have understood the instructions. The nurse should collaborate with the patient on the plan of care to obtain the patient compliance. When an acid-base imbalance occurs, the control of underlying disorder is a priority. Blood gases will be monitored and oxygen and electrolytes are administered as needed. Nursing measures to improve pulmonary functioning are instituted as necessary. Administering fluids through the veins is the most common means by which the water, electrolytes, nutrients, and some medications may be given 
when oral intake is not possible or needs to be supplemented. IV therapy is often used when a fluid deficit is present or when there are electrolyte imbalances. IV fluids may also be used to reestablish an acid-base balance. Medications are administered in an IV solution when rapid action is also required. Total parenteral nutrition is used for administering nutrients to patients that have gastrointestinal problems who cannot take in nutrients by mouth or any other means. There are different kinds of IV fluids. An isotonic fluid is a solution that has the same osmotic pressure as the intracellular fluids. The body cells can be bathed in an isotonic solution without a net flow of water across the cell membrane. Examples of an isotonic solution are 0.9% normal saline and lactated ringers. A hypotonic solution is a solution that has a lower osmotic pressure. It is less concentrated than that of the body fluids. Cells bathed in a hypotonic solution will swell as the water passes from the less concentrated solution across the cell membrane and into the cell. Sterile water is an example of hypotonic, hypotonic solution and it is never added to an IV solution. An example of a hypotonic solution is 0.45% sodium chloride solution. Hypertonic is a solution that has a higher osmotic pressure than that of the body fluids. The cells bathed in a hypertonic solution will shrink as the water passes out of the cells and into the fluid surrounding it. Examples are 5% dextrose in 0.9% saline and 5% dextrose in 0.5% saline. Blood-related fluids given IV will include whole blood, packed red cells, platelets, and plasma. Whole blood is rarely given. Even with hemorrhage, blood components are routinely given for replacement. Packed cells may be administered to patients that have anemia or other blood disorders. Plasma is stored in the frozen state, so the order will be for fresh frozen plasma, or FFP. Plasma is given primarily to replace coagulation factors, but may also be used to increase the blood volume, as in shock, and to provide protein. Protein can also be supplemented by the use of albumin. The treatment of shock is plasma expanders that are administered to increase the volume of the plasma. Examples of plasma expanders are low molecular weight dextran, albumin, hespan, and plasminate. As a nurse, we need to make sure that we teach the patient the reason for the administration of the fluid and or medications and the signs and symptoms of problems that they need to report. We need to make sure that we check the patient for drug allergies, we need to be aware of potential interactions with IV medications or irrigating solutions. The nurse must maintain sterility of all solutions, tubings, and connections. For intravenous solution safety, a plastic bag of solution may be squeezed to check for leaks. Any solution that is discolored or has small particles, a white cloud, or a film in it should not be used. If there is no vacuum in a bottle when it is open, the solution may be contaminated. Gently invert the bag or the bottle and hold it up to the light so that you as the nurse can see if there are any particles floating in it. For nursing responsibilities, as a nurse we must look at our Nursing Practice Act, we must consider safe and effective administration of medications, we must consider medical asepsis 
and we must also consider the joint commission and the patient identifiers. For the rights of IV therapy, it should be the right solution, the right dose, the right route, the right time, the right patient, as well as the right documentation. The rate of flow is an important factor in the safe and effective therapy of intravenous medications. Intravenous setups should be checked once every hour to be certain that the fluid is running correctly and that there are no problems. When possible, the nurse should use an IV pump that is set for the specific rate of flow to administer IV fluids. Intravenous pumps, although not infallible, will keep the IV fluids flowing at the desired rate and act as safeguards should a problem arise. Even when the IV pump is used, the nurse must check to see that it is delivering the solution accurately as prescribed. There are various principles that will affect the flow rate for IVs not administered by a pump, and these are higher containers that are above the level of the patient's heart have flat, faster flow rates. Fuller containers have faster flow rates. Viscous fluids, think about honey or syrup, these have slower flow rates. For an example, packed red blood cells will flow more slowly than 5% dextrose in water. The larger the needle diameter and the tubing, the flow will be faster. The higher the pressure within the vein, the slower the flow rate. As an infusion progresses and the veins become fuller, the IV solution may drip more slowly. Fluids will pass through a straight tube faster than through one that is coiled or hanging below the level of the cannula. Flushing the catheter or the IV line prevents contact and reactions between the fluid that was last infused and incompatible medications. Flushing the catheter or the line will maintain the patency of the lumen. Either normal saline or normal saline followed by heparin solution is used. For flushing IV catheters, the nurse should not use more than 30 ml of bacteriostatic normal saline within a 24 hour period to flush the catheter. The nurse should always use single dose vials or syringes of solution for flushing. The nurse should never use a multiple dose vial for the purpose because it may be contaminated and may cause the patient an infection. For central line care, if a gauze dressing is in place, the nurse should provide site care every 24 to 48 hours per the institution protocol. Transparent dressings require site care every five to seven days. Every central line dressing should be examined once every shift and the dressing should be changed if it is soiled. When drawing blood from a central line, this is performed following strict aseptic technique. Blood is withdrawn for discarding, then the sample will be obtained. Hyperdermoclysis is the slower infusion of isotonic fluid into the subcutaneous tissues. This may be used for small volumes of fluid. The front and the side of the thighs, the hips, the area above the clavicle, and the upper abdomen are usual sites for hypodermoclysis. A butterfly needle or a special sub-Q IV infusion device is used to provide access for the hypodermoclysis, clysis, excuse me, hyperdermoclysis fluid.
various nursing diagnoses to consider for patients receiving an IV would be a fluid or an excess fluid volume, a risk for an imbalanced fluid volume, ineffective tissue perfusion, decreased cardiac output, impaired gas exchange, ineffective breathing pattern, or risk for injury related to IV fluid administration. Nurses that work in long-term care facilities deal every day with the problems of delicate fluid balance in older patient populations. The patients often are taking multiple medications that can affect their fluid and electrolyte status. Diuretics can upset fluid and electrolyte status easily. It is especially important that the long-term care and the home care nurse be vigilant for signs of hypokalemia. Potassium imbalances are particularly dangerous for heart patients. Hypokalemia alters the method digitalis is metabolized in the body and predisposes the patient to digitalis toxicity. Signs of digitalis toxicity are fatigue, anorexia, headache, blurred vision, yellow-green halo around lights, nausea, diarrhea, and cardiac dysrhythmias.